So the last, the last topic of our CMP member panel is uh, novel therapeutics on treatment resistant bipolar uh, depression. That's a, a very hot topic because uh, bipolar depression is the most treatment resistant facet of bipolar disorder. So could you please be kind enough to? Well, uh, I think I'll, as I said this, as you said, um, uh, this is a, you know, a, a very heterogeneous condition and hard to treat. But interestingly enough, there's uh, not, uh, there's not many clinical trials or experimental novel treatments in bipolar depression specifically. Uh, but, um, you know, if you look at generally, the treatments are sort of like following the path of treatment resistant uh, uh, depression. And uh, you had a number of trials that uh, it's been tried, uh, some of them with less success. For example, you have polyunsaturated fatty acids used, uh, I think, uh, some, somewhere like uh, around eight, uh, run, uh, like seven randomized clinical trial, one open label. And seven out of these, uh, uh, seven out of um, eight uh, trials are, uh, are negative. So, uh, but you have also drugs like Momentine, which is like an NMD antagonist, minus cycline, uh, which seems to have, um, you know, the, the two open label and one randomized trial seem to be positive so far with limited number of patients. Uh, and they have, you know, other drugs like N-acetylcysteine, pregnenolone, NSAIDs, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. And I want to point out, you see like some of these drugs tailored toward tackling the neuroinflammatory basis of uh, bipolar depression. Uh, it is known that a bipolar depression patient, they have at least a subset of them, around a third of them have a heightened inflammatory tone when you measure some of the, uh, you know, biological markers of inflammation. And we're talking here about, you know, not very uh, validated biological markers such as CRP or IL-1, IL-6, as, uh, speaking of depression. But, uh, but a anyhow, like it seems some of those randomized trials with NSAID of, you know, the, or, uh, or uh, other drugs has not panned out, like zero out of two trials are negative, uh, are, are, so, so it didn't work. Uh, you have also pioglitazone, which is like, you know, one open label and two uh, uh, randomized clinical trials. Two out of three uh, seem to be, uh, to be positive. But um, and then you have uh, coenzyme Q, Q10, maybe uh, ketamine. Uh, and, and I want to uh, like stop because my, some of my expertise lies in the, the, the ketamine trial. And two, of the, two out of those four studies, which two are open label and two are cl uh, the, the randomized clinical trial that were conducted at NIMH, four out of four are positive trials, meaning that perhaps there is a, a place for uh, use of uh, drugs like ketamine uh, in the uh, sort of like maybe second or third phase of the treatment resistance after the uh, first line and second line therapy has has failed um, uh, failed in this patient. What is interesting is like uh, the one of the new guidelines that come from as a, as a modification of the Delphi group. Uh, they do, uh, what I see there like they do not put in their second or third line or even the fourth line of treatment ketamine. And, and this is, I think, this is interesting because, uh, as I said, ketamine not only appeared to be working in bipolar depression per se, but appeared to be working in, you know, uh, conditions that are associated with disease, like sleep, for example, or anhedonia or fatigue, which oftentimes these uh, patients present, and more importantly, the suicide, uh, suicidal ideation. I think, so, um, the, the, what I expect in the future is that novel definitions of of, um, of guidelines or algorithms for uh, bipolar disorder, but, but bipolar depression in, in more specifically, includes so, so sort of what we call neurobiological correlates into the picture. So, so far what we have is like mainly failed pharmacological trial with uh, behavioral measures, but there's no neuroimaging I include, no sleep studies included, no, uh, you know, classic neurobiological correlate that may give us a better and more interesting, uh, like more sort of representative picture of what sort of a patient groups we're dealing with. Indeed, and novel treatments are, are, are very exciting in relation to bipolar depression. Uh, the, the, the difficulty in bipolar depression is of course uh, in terms of 
being able to evaluate new treatments with a very difficult to find and, and, and difficult to assess group. Uh, of course, that uh, opportunity is, um, a challenge is always opportunity, so there are many, many possibilities. You've talked quite a bit about, about the, the um, drugs with novel mechanisms, and certainly ketamine is very exciting and, uh, and has also opened up the way to think about other novel mechanisms of, of yeah. action, MGLU-R2 uh, and 3, 5, um, e, AAT, uh, AMP, and so there's, there's uh, very exciting work um, going on in, in that direction. You've also meant, mentioned anti-inflammatories and, um, and, and novel ways of being able to immunomodulate, and I think those are, th those are amazing directions f um, for research to go. There's also repurposing of, of, of older drugs and thinking yep. about uh, antihypertensives, uh, um, antibiotics, even thinking about um, uh, CBD, um, cannabidiol, yep. and, and now opiates are, are, are making somewhat of a comeback looking uh, at, those, at their properties. Also um, hallucinogenics like um, LSD. And finally, one of the other things that I think will be interesting over the next few years is the, is the extension of some of the treatments that we already have, uh, looking at, um, at neurostimulation, at uh, light treatment, and trying to further refine and, and understand how to use those treatments uh, um, more effectively. Also clozapine. I think clozapine has been significantly under, underrated in, in relation to the um, to the treatment of, of, um, of resistant states. And certainly clozapine, like lithium, is one of those incredibly uh, profoundly efficacious medications. Although clozapine doesn't have a, a, an excellent evidence base in treatment resistant depression, it's clearly a, a medication which, um, which has its place in treatment resistant mania and may yet uh, uh, find um, its, its, its place within our treatment guidelines. So certainly, uh, uh, as I said, challenge is opportunity and there are lots of ways in which we might uh, watch things go forward in the next few years. So I want to comment a little bit about the, uh, the, some of these uh, sort of uh, um, conceptually complex drugs. We're talking about clozapine and lithium and, and ketamine. Certainly it falls into that category. I think uh, I, I want to point out that we actually uh, ketamine is in, in, in its early stages of studies, and we don't know a lot about its rather complex mechanism of action. And uh, I think pointing out in some of the ketamine-based drugs or like glutamate-based drugs, which are like developed and repurposed after the, the ketamine sort of success, you see like uh, we had just recently in the past few months three different failed clinical trials in treatment resistant depression uh, of, of drugs like ketamine, like uh, one example is lanisamine, uh, Glix-13, which is a, a glycine binding um, uh, antagonist, and also you have AV-101, another glycine binding uh, antagonist. So, but these are, uh, these are drugs that were like sort of designed to emulate or like to simulate the effect of ketamine, the antidepressant effect of ketamine, but are devoid of, but are devoid of psychomedic and dissociative side effects. And so, so uh, it seems like, and uh, rather interestingly, in some of the phases, preclinical phases, those drugs seem to have a robust effect, at least in the animal models, but also in early clinical phases, but they failed uh, the phase two or three um, clinical studies. So um, there are, like uh, I think, aspects of complex drugs uh, in psychiatry to be discussed about. And in this case, I think trying to uh, sort of uh, sanitize medications from their side effects oftentimes, you know, could be in the lack of the uh, therapeutic efficacy. And uh, in this regard, I think... Uh, what, what, what happened to the channel, uh, acti to the um, calcium channel uh, active ingredients? There was some discussion a few years ago that uh, uh, compounds active on uh, uh, calcium channels would be efficacious, but I think everything was negative. In Exactly. I, I mean, I, I, indeed, indeed, some of the, uh, the, the, the clinical trials in that are, are negative. But uh, I think there's, um, you know, like a lot of genetic studies on bipolar disorder point out the uh, sort of like this, you know, uh, the, the alteration of this calcium channel, uh, uh, like gene uh, that regulates the calcium channels. And a lot of trials were designed or, or in that regard, but 
uh, to my knowledge, there is no <laughs> clinical trial that appears to but be efficacious. But calcium channels are, are connected to the uh, excitatory amino acid Absolutely. system, yeah. so yeah. it could be uh, a communicating vessel thing. Well, I, I think, again, we're going to the, 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 the point of fine-tuning. I think there's no better NMD drug antagonist drug like momentine, but momentine failed in, uh, in both depression and bipolar disorder. The reason for this is, like, this is a, you know, it's more like a sort of sanitized drug that works in a certain receptor. But ketamine is not only a NMD antagonist, but it's what we call NMD glutamate modulator. It works in as NMD antagonist, like acutely, but the sustained activity of ketamine appear to be related to the, you know, uh, activation on path throughput and uh, mglur 2 3 uh, receptor. So it's like it seems that and and other receptor mu and, and kappa and delta or opioid receptor. So it seems that the the the, the the mechanism is rather much more complex than we understand currently, and you know I think the it's it's still a hot, like a hot topic for research uh, in the field.